Amen. And praise the Lord. I must say, each time that I hear that my time is almost coming to an end here, I kind of get all welled up and a little sad and things, but I'm also rejoicing because I've had this great experience. So, today we're coming, and before we come, let us pray. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O oh Lord, open our hearts, mind, and spirit to receive your word in Jesus' name. Our sermon topic today is fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. Now, there are also information. Sometimes we look at research and we want to make sure that we know that fullness of joy is definitely something we need to know. So the Disciple Ministries of the United Methodist Church series, A Living Hope, in which 1 Peter 1 through 9, read by Pastor Charlene Hill, provides the focus scripture for this sermon today, A Fullness of Joy. We are still basking in the glow. Maybe we're exhausted from the excessive of the Easter celebration. Maybe even the choir wants a week off. Maybe their social pastor is preaching, but we're still celebrating, or we should be. Notice the day is named Second Sunday of Easter. That of is important. We are Easter people. All of our worship is resurrection worship. We continue to proclaim that Christ is risen when we gather to worship during this season. Well, yes, we claim that all year long because every Sunday is an Easter Sunday. First Peter is not a letter we read all that often. It is kind of just tucked away in the back all the way in the back near the end of the Old Testament. How many of us sometimes look back there and we pass by Peter? I'll just sit back here out of the way so as not to bother anyone, it says. Call me if you need me, but I hope you won't really. And why so shy? Besides the fact that Peter had been through the ringer and was probably a little skittish. Well, this letter isn't really for us. What I mean, it is, of course, all scripture is God breathed and useful for building up. This letter was written when the church was under constant threat, when the benediction was spoken in a whisper, because everyone knew when they gathered, Again, someone would likely be missing, caught up in the cleansing, deportation, and imprisonment. Sounds much like today, correct? They were afraid of their neighbors. They were afraid of people might discover that they practice a minority religion, a suspect faith. Christians, a minority religion, a suspect faith. They worry that neighbors might turn them into the increasingly vigilant authorities who were out to make the nation safe. And we've heard about making the nation safe. They were looked at with suspicions as they passed their neighbors on the street. They didn't feel safe in their own hometowns, their own places of work. They were, in fact, model citizens, Christians not feeling safe, not able to walk down the street. They were, in fact, the ones who did the jobs no one else would do. Christians often care for the dead. I don't know about you, but um, being in a cemetery, caring for the dead, a lot of us will be pretty screamish. They were the ones that gave the precious bodies a decent burial. 
They believed that life was bigger than what we could see with our eyes, but others thought this was just odd, icky, and scary. So questions began to be raised in the communities of faith. I believe that's happening right now. We have questions, especially post-COVID. Should we go underground? Should we hide? Blend in, act like them, and let's not pretend we don't know who them are. Would it be safer to pretend we aren't saved by grace through faith? Should we act as though we weren't asked to pray for our enemies and pray for those who persecute us because it's risky and darn hard? Darn hard. The question was, should our faith move inside, inside our heads, inside our hearts? Should it be personal faith that keeps us safe and warm where it really matters in the imagination of our inner life? Christians being secretive? I don't know. Was Jesus secretive? Hmm. I might add, our church, the United Church of Hyde Park, has been engaging in questions too. We had congregational conversations around, why do we come to church? Why invest in the daycare? Why do I go to church? Because it's one thing to come, it's another thing to actually go. Why should the church continue to exist? And don't think we're the only ones. There are millions of churches out there asking the same questions. Why, why, why? And we've had three conversations around this. And we're going to have many more. There, in these questions, Peter set to answer this in his letter. You know that little letter that's kind of at the end of the New Testament, hiding acting like it doesn't belong or want to be noticed? Let's be aware that there are some who don't think this letter was actually written by Peter. The timing is wrong. They say the vocabulary doesn't sound like a Galilean fisherman. Besides, his name was Simon, not Peter. Hmm, I get that, and they're probably right. But doesn't it sound like Peter would do If he didn't write it, then maybe he said it and later someone wrote it down and probably put his name on it too. So if he didn't write it, I'm sure he did it without a sense of irony. How many have said something, someone has wrote it down or they took it and passed it along? If the question is, should we hide, is the one being addressed, who better than Peter to answer it? Peter, who professed his loyalty to his Lord with more conviction and then read like a scared bunny when things got heated. Okay? Let's not be too harsh on Peter. Peter, who can claim his steadfastness with loud protest and claim to not know who they were talking about when someone asked him about Jesus. How many of us have done that? Of course, Peter will answer this question. He's been there. He understands the pull to save one's own skin. He has grasps on reality. He knows what will work and what won't. He's a pragmatic as they come. So who is better? What do you say, Peter? Stay safe? By no means. Remember, a minority religion, a suspect religion, deportation, sounds like today. We need to study the whole letter to get all the answers, but we can catch a glimpse of Peter's spirit even in these opening verses. 
a new birth. That's our gift. A new life not based on merits. Not earned by the sweat of our brows, but by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Someone didn't hear that. Someone didn't hear that. Not earned by the sweat of our brows, but by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And now that gift is ours? Ooh, someone should be clapping their hand to Jesus. And nothing can diminish it. Nothing can snatch it out of your grasp, but it is ours. I own it. You own it. Pastor Hill owns it. As sure as we breathe, as sure as the light we see, as sure as the hope in our hearts, it is ours, the gift of life. This way of seeing ourselves and all creation around us, it is ours. How do you know it's yours? There's only one response to that, only one, only one. Rejoice. rejoice. Say the word rejoice. rejoice. Now, this is not the only place in Peter that you hear about the word rejoice. You're going to hear it in a whole lot of parts of the Bible. Psalm 16 tells us the same thing, that in God there is joy. In God there is joy. That joy is found in obedience and finding our place in the kingdom. Not just the kingdom, but the kingdom. And following the counsel and living into the instructions. All this is about joy day by day. Trusting in the constant presence of God and the blessings of fullness that we find in relationships with the creator. I don't know about you. Therefore, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My soul rejoices. So yes, of course, rejoice. And there are times when I can rejoice. Times when things are going well and I can contemplate the fullness of the promise of eternity. Hmm. Did we need to meditate on that? Then yes, I can look inward and rejoice. Feel good about what has been given, content and satisfied. Back to Peter. Oh no, says Peter, grinning in his beard. You rejoice even if it's for a little while you suffer. Okay. There's that word. Wait a minute. What? Rejoice while suffering? Now, some of us would say, we, we don't need to put that in the same sentence because suffering and rejoice are on the opposite ends here, but that's okay. That doesn't compute, and I know, right? Says Peter. But yeah, it really does. Here's the thing, you're alive. I know and I like to stay that way. No, alive, not just living. Understand, alive, not just living. You're alive, which means that everything and anything that happens is just a moment in eternity. Just a blip on the screen. So all those things that terrify you don't mean anything. Somebody's back there saying, what does she mean? There's things out here that are scary. They can't diminish you. They can't break you. You're alive and not just living. Somebody didn't hear that. They can't diminish you. They can't break you. 
You're alive. I don't know about anyone else. I didn't get that then. I get it now. All there is is love. All there is is love. If you know that, say amen. Back to Peter. Peter laughs at his own thoughts. Sounds like a pop song. Sounds like a pop song, doesn't it? But it's the truth, the deep truth, not the surface truth. Love that starts with Jesus, the one I turned my back on, but who never turned his back on me. Love of Jesus, who loves so deeply, it shakes you to the core. Who has had shaking core love from Jesus? Love so profound, we are remade made alive, call it salvation. That's the only word that fits. We are being saved by God's love. Say to love as God loves. Say to live as Jesus. Does that sound like a party or what? Now I know some of us go to different parties, but that sounds like a party. His teeth gleamed through the tangle of a beard, weathered face wrinkling around his eyes as he reaches out with those big fisherman hands to slap you on the back. Welcome to the party. Welcome to the party. He shouts a little too loudly. Rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. Rejoice when your friend, family member, and child receives life-saving hospital care. Rejoice every day that you are made in God's image. Rejoice when you had a loved one that has passed away because you knew them, you lived with them, and you loved them. Rejoice when God has provided you a blessing in just the nick of time. He paid that bill. He put gas in that car. He fed you. Rejoice when you survive the bad day at work or a confrontation that brings negative vibes. Rejoice when the weather is bad. Rejoice when the weather is good. Rejoice when you face fear. Rejoice when you have overcome. Rejoice when you pray to pass that exam. Rejoice when your child, friend, or family member graduates from school this year. Rejoice when the weather is beautiful again. Rejoice in prayer. Rejoice in song. Rejoice in the relationship with God. Rejoice, 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 rejoice. Rejoice. Amen. Thank you.